See, Paul made a statement in the book of Corinthians. It's Corinthians chapter 5, I believe it is, in verse 8. Corinthians 5, 8. It says, he said, it's better to be absent from the body. Now, I understand that's referencing probably more, Paul is saying, to be out of here. But there is another meaning to it. To be absent from the body means that you're not focused on your body. Meaning, your body means nothing. It has no significance other than to get you around here on this earth. You say, well, Pastor, really? Is that, is that true? Well, think about it. Think about back in Genesis, when did Adam and Eve become concerned about or know they had a body? When they became disconnected from God. We came into this world and we were disconnected from God. Jesus came to make the connection again. But Adam and Eve, they, didn't, they weren't even aware of their body until they became disconnected of God, from God, which means when they sinned, they became disconnected from God. And when they became disconnected, what did they do? They went and hid and covered themselves with fig leaves. Why? Because all of a sudden they were aware. Well, I got this body. What is this thing? Because up to that point it was just them and God. This body had no, the, the body had no significance whatsoever to Adam and Eve. They didn't even know that they had one. I really believe that. They did not know they had one because they, didn't, they weren't concerned about covering it up until they became disconnected from God. See, when we get born again, we, the, the, the purpose of our born again, I believe one of the main purposes of our born again experience, it reconnects us with God. So if it reconnects us with God, then what should we disconnect from? Our flesh. Our emotions. The circumstances of life. The things that are going on around us. That doesn't mean you walk around with your head in the clouds. It just means that now you're reconnected and your body, your flesh, the life that you used to live, no longer makes determinations for you. No longer tells you this is the way to do it. That's the, that's the renewing of the mind. That's the transformation process that takes place is you begin to start thinking spiritually. Until you begin to make that transition and recognize the insignificance of these bodies and this world, you'll, it's going to be very difficult to put Jesus on display. Do you think sickness tried to attack Jesus' body? Absolutely it did. He was in the earth. But he was so connected to the Father that it couldn't. See, the more connected we become, the less everything that, the, the, the nature of sin, because see, that, we've got to understand too, is the sin nature has been taken out of us. The sin nature is gone. And the sin nature is the flesh. It's been taken. That's why the Bible says, Galatians 2.20, it says, I, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. We have a brand new identity. We have a brand new identity. <laughs> we can't identify with anything in this world anymore. We should actually look at the things around us and go, I just can't identify with that. You ever talk to somebody and as you're talking to them, they'll go, well, I just, I just can't identify with you. That's the way we ought to be in the world. When someone is saying, well, you know, this is going on and that's going on and you need to do this, just say, yeah, I just can't identify with that. I... See, everything that's going on in our nation right now, 
I, I, I just, I can't identify with COVID-19. I, I just, I don't understand. I just can't identify with it. But if you talk to people that are walking in fear of it, and I'm just using this example because it's so fresh right now, but if you talk to people, even in the church, that are in fear of it or whatever, it's because they're identifying with sickness. They're identifying with disease. They're identifying with plagues. Why would you identify with that? How can you identify with something that's not part of your identity? You are the healed. You're not trying to get healed. You are the healed. That's your new identity. See, I said back a couple of weeks ago uh, that when someone is asked to be a witness, and Jesus has asked us to be a witness, has he not? I shared last week, Matthew 28, says that he's been given all authority and he's now, now he's commanded us to go into all the world to preach the gospel. That doesn't mean throw scriptures at somebody. That means tell them good news that God loves them. Yeah. It's really simple. Do you know that God loves you and he's not mad at you? But over in Acts 1.8, we know that Jesus told the disciples to wait, to go to the upper room, to go to Jerusalem and wait until they be endued with power. And then they would be witnesses. So if you're in here this morning and you've been endued with power, you're a witness. Well, when, you're, when a witness in the natural, in a case, is called forward to witness or to be a witness for something, and it's a, it's a pretty high-profile case, they need protection after that. So they enter into the witness protection program. And when they enter into that witness protection program, see, we, we can't be afraid to go out and witness because as we witness, we're in the witness protection program. We can witness of the things that Jesus did and witness of the things that the enemy does and not have to worry. When I say witness, meaning tell the falsehoods. What's going on right now in your life is a result of sin. It's a result of the fallen nature of man. And when, when, men, when men and women enter into the witness protection program, they're given a brand new identity. They're given a brand new identity. Their name's not the same anymore. They're not even associated with their family. I mean, that, doesn't that open the scripture up when Jesus says, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is? He's not saying that you don't love your family, but you need to understand something. You, you can't identify with them any longer. Come on. You don't identify with them any longer. And, and for the witness protection program to work when you get that new identity means you give, you give up everything that your life was. Everything. Mm -hmm. Now I know there's people in here already, I can just sense it squirming. Well, everything, you got, well, you know, I, this, 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 and this, but not this. Because in the witness protection program, they completely change their identity and they'll tell you you can't go back to anything or anybody you once knew. Because if you do, if they're looking for you, those that want to kill you, they will find you. Or you'll put yourself in a position to be found out. Now, does that mean that you don't ever talk to anybody again? No, you can, we can run everything into the ditch. Well, that means you can't. Well, that means I can't go back. I can't, I can't ever talk to anybody again that I once knew. No, it's not saying that. In the spiritual significance of it, I'm, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is for your benefit, is you can't identify with anything of your past. Nothing. If you begin to identify yourself with your past, just like in the natural, if somebody is in the witness protection program and they identify with their past, they put themselves in a very precarious condition or position to possibly be taken out. And they start living their life looking over their shoulder. 
All because they wanted to go back to something or someone that they once knew. See, we're talking about putting Jesus on display. We're talking about identity here, who you're identifying with now. You have a brand new identity, which means your old life. It, it may have been crucified, but if you want to try to go dig something up in it, if you want to go back to try to look something up in it, what does it do? It puts you in a position to be taken out by who? The thief. The one that you witnessed Christ against. And you put yourself in a very dangerous situation. We might as well just call it for what it is because it's dangerous. It could take you out. Literally take you out. And if it doesn't take you out, it can steal a lot from you. It can destroy, he can destroy your life. That's why he says as the thief, he, to kill, steal, and destroy. He came for one reason, to kill, steal, and destroy. So if you look back at, want to acquaint yourself with again, in any way, shape, or form, you're opening up the door for the thief to possibly kill you or kill something in your life. Could be relationships. You're opening the door up for the thief to come and steal some things from you. Destroy you. Come on. Y'all are quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. We need to know who we are. I said we need to know who we are. And when we know who we are is when we can begin to put Jesus on display. But until we know that, it's hard to put him on display. Amen? It's hard to put him on display. I just want to remind you the definitions, some of the definitions that I gave you last week on, on just the word display. Display means make a prominent exhibition of something in a place where it can be easily seen. Which means we're not undercover Christians. We had to be bold and loud. When I say loud, that doesn't mean you go around screaming about Jesus. But loud means that we're wide open. We're wide open about Jesus. I mean, just think about in the world, the LBGTQ movement. And what, what, what it's a, thank God COVID-19, this is one area I could say, thank God COVID-19 actually came along because they canceled gay pride. But think about the name, gay pride. They're proud. Proud and loud about their identity. Even though that's not their identity, they need to know their identity. And we need to pray for them to find out their identity and who they are in Christ. Because they're not believing who God created them to be, so they don't know their identity. But just the, the title, they have gay pride movements, gay pride parades. Because they're proud. Well, how much more should we be? Bold, loud, proud. Proud of Christ. Not proud of who we are. Proud of Christ and who Christ is in us. What Christ has done through us. Proud to put him on display. Instead of waving, instead of waving uh, banners of the, of the rainbow, we ought to be waving banners of Christ. Well, what is waving banners of Christ? Your life? Your life is to be the banner. I said your life is to be the banner. And we ought to be waving that banner high. Come on, when the Israelites waved the banner, they won the victory. They would defeat the armies. Man, when we wave the banner, the gates of hell will not prevail. Meaning those gates, gates are always a picture of, or always meant, of something that holds something back or locks something in. Well, what's locked in? What's being held back? People from seeing Christ. But when we wave our banner high, when we put Jesus on display, when we display the goodness of God, when we display the love of God, when we display Christ in all of his glory, 
It says the gates of hell will not prevail. Which means the gates can't hold back the lost. The gates get pushed open. And when the gates get pushed open, light comes in. And all of a sudden, people start, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Y'all are still quiet out there. It's okay to shout. Say amen, Pastor. Amen, Pastor. <laughs> but to make a prominent exhibition of something in a place where it can be easily seen, to make evident, <laughs> to make evident, to produce something that's already in us. See, we're, we're, we've already got that relationship with Christ. Remember one of the definitions that, that I gave last week was to make a breeding, which means to have it, it, the, the definition or the explanation underneath that is penguins copulating. I don't know why they used penguins, but they just did. <laughs> but meaning intimacy with Christ. The re, it's talking about the reproduction. See, when you're intimate with Christ and you know who he is, and he's already on the inside of you. When you're having that intimacy and you know him. See, I'll just say it this way. There's too many in the body of Christ that are having casual sex with Jesus. And they ain't reproducing nothing. Reproduction the display of Christ, the reproducing of his character comes through intimacy. Knowing him and knowing who you are in him. And the reproduction comes naturally. See, that takes the whole works mentality out of it. You don't have to work at trying to be like Christ. Just become intimate with him and you are him. I don't know if it was last week or the week before. I don't know when. Dogs don't have to work at being a dog. They just know they're a dog. So they bark. They wag their tails. They fetch things. For some of us, and I've used this example before, for some of us, there's things because of our closeness with our parents or what have you in growing up, we do those things because of our closeness with them. There's things that, that we just do the same. She didn't do it that way when I met her, or I may have not done it that way when I met her, but because of our intimacy and our continued time together, we just do things the same way. See, when you spend time with Jesus and the, your relationship becomes so tight with him, it, you don't have to work at displaying him because you just see him all the time and you see what he's doing. Why do you think Jesus said, I only say what I hear the Father say and I only do what I see the Father do? Do you think he visually saw every single time the Father doing something? No, because of his continued relationship and intimacy with the Father. Before he came and after he was on the earth, just going to meet with the Father, he could see a situation and just, I just know exactly how my Father's going to deal with that. I just know how he's going to, I, just, I know exactly what he would say in this situation. It's kind of like being a Radar O'Reilly. <laughs> Come on. Turn with me, if you would, over to Colossians chapter 3. I always love, this is one of my favorite scriptures, favorite passages, really. The book of Colossians is one of my favorite books. I'm going to read it out of the New Living. But Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, I use this so much. But it, it's a reality of putting Jesus on display. It says, since you've been raised to new life, we're talking about our identity, Remember I shared last week, Galatians 2 and 20. Since we've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless not I that lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. The distilled version says, I've died and it's just simply Jesus using my body. 
I mean, that's simple. Letting Jesus just use your body. But that means you have to let go. You have to let go if you're going to let Jesus use your body. So it says, since you've been raised to new life, since you have been. Notice that it says, you have been raised to new life. We're not waiting to get raised to new life. We, we sometimes will think, and we may not intentionally do it, but sometimes we'll think about, about when we get to heaven that that's when new life is. But Paul is saying here, since you have been, you have been, say that, I have been, I have been raised, to new life. raised to new life. You have been raised to new life. You're not waiting to get raised to new life. You have been raised to new life. When you accepted Christ, you were raised to new life, which means you have a new life, a new identity. But it's up to you whether or not you want to walk in your new identity and your new life. You don't have to. But if you don't, you'll never put Jesus on display. Well, what do you mean, my old, my old life, my old death? The old way you used to do things, the old way you used to think. See, the old way I used to think, I'll use this uh, as an example for myself, the old, one of the old ways that I used to think was that I could never stand in front of people and talk. That was my old way of thinking. I couldn't do that. I can't stand in front of So when I was in high school, junior high and high school, how many of you ever had speech class when you were in school where you had to give oral speeches? I never gave one oral speech when I was in school because I would skip class the day that it was my turn and take a failing grade because I couldn't speak in front of people. And so I said, I can't do that. And, I, and, and then I would even say, and I'm not gonna. See, the power, I got a failing grade. <laughs> but then, Jesus got a hold of my heart. Jesus came to live, Christ came to live on the inside of me. That it's nevertheless that not I that liveth, but it's Christ that lives in me. See, I can only do this now because it's Christ that lives in me. And if I allow the old identity, the old way of thinking of what I couldn't do, what I wouldn't do, I wouldn't be standing here. Because 30 years later, every once in a while, it's amazing how the enemy, he, I don't care how long you've been saved, I don't care what victories you have in your life, he is still the same old slew foot devil that he's always been. He'll come back and try to see if you're still standing firm in what you believe. And I still to this day will have Sunday mornings where he'll come along and he'll say, you can't get up there and minister to these people. And there's still times up until now for a brief moment, it'll got that, <gasps> and I'll think, I got nothing to share this morning. And then Christ will come, I'll say, what did I just hear you say? It's like, you're right. Because it's not me. But the enemy, what he likes to do is he wants to come along and try to show you a picture of your old you, your old identity. He'll even bring up a photograph. Remember who you were? You've got to be bold enough to say, no. I don't remember who I was. See, y'all need to forget who you were. We all need to forget who we were. The person is dead. The old identity is dead. It's deceased. It doesn't exist. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your old identity, your old way of doing things, your old way of living is passed away. I mean, what do we say when someone dies? Oh, so-and-so passed away. Paul says it in Corinthians. You're a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away it means old things died. If they died, think about it. If a person, we say a person's passed away, that means that person can't do anything anymore. They're dead. The body's dead. It's gone. The spirit went on to be with the Lord. 
if they're born again. But the body's dead. I don't care what you do, that body's never going to do anything again. Without the spirit in it, it's not going to do anything. It'll never smoke another cigarette. It'll never have another drink. Come on. It'll never take another hit off that joint. Come on. It'll never have another affair. Come on. It'll never have casual sex again. Come on. And until we realize that, uh, that identity, that old us, and I'm not, maybe you didn't do them things, but you did something. <laughs> you did something that was contrary to the nature and life of God. Yeah, it'll never lie again. It'll never tell a, a little fib. See, a fib is the same as a lie. We like to lighten it up and make it sound like, well, it's, just, it's not that big a thing. It's just a little white lie. A lie is a lie is a lie. <laughs> Come on. But that dead body will never do anything again. It can't. We need to understand that that old us is dead. It can't do anything unless we allow it to do something. We give it life. Don't give it life. How do you not give it life? You trust in the life of Christ that lives in you. You have a new life. We're talking about putting Jesus on display. So it says here, I'm going to go back to Colossians. I didn't even get to reading this. It says, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Since you have been raised to new life, Paul is saying, now you need to set your sights. You need to focus on. You need to give your full attention to. You need to zero in on, set your sights. Zero in on. Don't do it half-hearted. Sight in. Remember I talked about that a few weeks ago. I don't remember what it was, but just pop back. Talking about sighting in. You got to sight in. See, many times we live lives not sighted in. So we may hit the target one day and we may not hit it the next day. But set your sights. Sight in. On the things of Christ. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. See, that's our new reality. This what we see around us is not our reality. We have a new reality. That reality is heaven. That reality is living life by faith. That reality is living by the dictates of heaven. And it's not hard because the kingdom lives on the inside of us. The kingdom of heaven lives on the inside of us. So now we start living out of the inside instead of out of the outside. Because the outside is dead. It doesn't sustain life. The old man's dead. It does not sustain life. It can't sustain life unless we put life into it by doing something outside or contrary to what Jesus is asking us to do. And it's not about self-will. It's not about, about uh, you know, just digging in and I'm just going to do the right thing. No, it's just training yourself to listen to the voice of Christ on the inside of you and then do what he says. Because that takes willpower, self-will, and everything out of it. It's just that I'm going to start listening to somebody else other than me. That's when it doesn't become works. It's not works if we're doing what someone tells us. I mean... <laughs> So since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Let heaven, let heaven fill your thoughts. Let heaven fill your thoughts. What should fill your thoughts? Heaven. heaven. Well, what is heaven? How do you let heaven fill your thoughts? 
You can only let heaven fill your thoughts when you begin to know what heaven is and that heaven lives on the inside of you, that the kingdom of God lives on the inside of you. You begin to think like Jesus thinks. You begin to think like the Holy Ghost. How do you begin to think like the Holy Ghost? Intimacy with him. I think like she thinks and she thinks like I think because we've spent time together. There's things that she does that I don't even have, like I say, you, you live a Radar O'Reilly type life. She doesn't even have to say anything. I just know what she wants. I, there's some times that, that I don't have to say anything. She just knows what I want. I'll walk into the house and she'll have something. I'm like, how did you know? Because we spend time together. Intimacy. Intimacy. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Through intimacy is how heaven fills your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on the earth. Now see, it doesn't, I, I love that that Paul establishes that because it's not like you just live with your head in the clouds. Paul knows that we're supposed to, that we're here on the earth. So he knows there's things that need to be tended to. He knows we've got families. He knows that we've got jobs. He knows all those things, but he's saying, don't put your focus on these things. Don't place importance on them that should not be placed on them. Do not place them things above Christ. I talked about last week about idols and idolatry. Anything that takes the place of Christ in your life is an idol. And it can be anything. Anything. And only you know what that is. But you can, all of us, we can all look at our own lives and say, well, this is the one thing that I will not do. Or this is the one thing that I'm not giving up. It's an idol. Idols aren't good when you're a believer. It's not good. And if, we, if you've got them, and I would probably say that everybody in here does, ask the Lord to help you with it. Lord, help me lay that down. I don't want it to be an idol. I don't want it to take the place that only you should have. I don't want it to. I want to become more intimate with you so then I can put you on display. But it says, let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. For you died when Christ died and your real life. See, you died when Christ died. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your real life, is revealed. Reveal, identity, uh, display. When your real life is revealed. When your real life is put on display. When you start displaying who you really are. And when Christ who is your real life is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. Just think that God, that you're going to share in his glory. When your real life is revealed. We're talking about Jesus on display. That's your real life. Your life in Christ is your real life, and Paul is telling the Colossian church here, you need to let that real life be revealed to the whole world. It needs to be put on display to the whole world. Glory to God. Glory to God. We're just going to look at a couple more scriptures here. John chapter 14, verse 9. John chapter 14. I'm going to read this out of the New King James. Will. John. Chapter 14. Actually, let's back up to verse 7. We'll pick up, I'm just going to share this with you and then we'll pick up next week. Ah, all right. You got something? That's good. John chapter 14, verse 7, it says, If you had known me, you would have, this is Jesus talking. If you had known me, because the disciples are asking him. Jesus just said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Just leading up to this. 
And the, Jesus, and the disciples are asking him, who, Lord, we do not know when you're going and how, how we know the way. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you'll know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. <laughs> Jesus just said, if you'd known me, you would have known the Father. And they've just spent several years with him. And this Phil's response is, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus said, if you knew me. See, Jesus is making a very stark reality here for them is that they really didn't know him for who he was. They were watching the things he did. They were listening to the words he spoke. But the uncertainty of, is this really the Messiah? Is this really the Christ? Lord, show us the Father, verse 8, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long and yet you've not known me. Jesus now even rebukes Philip. It's like, I have been with you for so long and you still don't know me. Can we identify with that? I have been saved for 10 years and I still don't know you. Why? I mean, I could tell you right now, if you, if you lived with anybody for 10 years, you'd probably get to know them a little bit, wouldn't you? If you lived with somebody for three years, if you lived with somebody for one year, I mean, if you lived with them, you'd know some things about them. And Jesus is saying, you've been with me this long and you still don't know me. Why was he saying that? Well, I'm sure they knew how he slept. I'm sure they knew how he ate. But he wasn't talking about the natural things. He's talking about the spiritual. Remember, I started out talking about the spiritual things of life. We're too wrapped up in knowing the natural things of this life, even our own natural lives. We're even trying to identify Christ through our natural understanding. That's why God said in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Lean not to your own understanding. You're not going to understand God in your natural way of thinking. God can only be understood spiritually. And since he can only be understood spiritually, Jesus came and solved the spiritual issue so that you could become spiritually in tune to him and begin to understand him the way he intended for us to understand him. That's why the world can't understand him. That's why the world says things about us and to us that seem so bad, but they don't understand him in any other way. That's why the world, when we're, when we're going to preach the gospel or share the gospel, that's where we need to keep with is the gospel. God loves you. God loves you. Because if, they, if you try to give them anything else or try to share anything, anything other than God loves them, they don't get it. I didn't get anything of the scriptures. I didn't get anything of God's nature and character until I accepted Christ and became a child of God. Then all of a sudden, things started to become illuminated. It's like, I get it now. And I'm only 30 years old, and I'm still just getting some things. It's like, I, have, I have aha moments all the time. It's just like, oh my gosh, I'm 30 years old. You think about that, man. We, we, we like to go around saying, well, I've been saved for, I could go around, I've been saved for 30 years. Well, big whoop. Do you know your father? Well, I go to church. I pray. I read the word. I don't care if you go to church, pray, read the word. Do you know your father? If you do, tell me about him. Well, the Bible says, I don't care. Tell me about your personal experience with him. See, Jesus says, if you'd have known me, how is it that I've been with you this long and you still don't know me? Because they weren't seeing with the right eyes. Remember the whole year, this whole year started out seeing as God sees. 
It's just seeing with the eyes that he's given us. He's given us a new set of eyes. Seeing when you see him properly, then you can display him. When you see yourself in him, you can display him. But if you see yourself the way you used to be, you can't display him. What you'll display is the way you used to be. Nobody wants to see the way you used to be. <laughs> Nobody wants to see the way I used to be, I can tell you that. I'm not going to go into the way I used to be because that person's dead. You know, a lot of people love to give their testimony and they spend a whole lot of time on the way they used to be. I, psh, that person's dead. He stinketh. <laughs> he doesn't need to be resurrected. And if I talk about him, I'm resurrecting him. And I'm putting on display the old me. Why do I want to display the old me? There was nothing good about the old me. Nothing. There was not one good thing about the old me. Now, will I talk about the new me? Yeah, because the new me has Christ living in him. So in reality, I'm really talking about Christ. This is what Christ has done. But Jesus says here, Philip said to him, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father. And, uh, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? I'll close with that statement right there. We ought to, to put Christ on display, our new identity, we ought to become so confident in our new identity and who we are in Christ that we should be able to confidently and boldly say, if you've seen me, you've seen Christ. If you've seen me, you've seen Christ. By the way we live, by the way we operate, by the way we love, and any other part of the character of Christ, he lives on the inside of us. If anybody comes up and says, show me Jesus, show me Christ, we should be, hey, if you've seen me. If people, put it this way, if people aren't coming up and asking you, or if they're coming up and asking you is what I should say, if they're coming up and asking you, show me Christ, Maybe we're not displaying him very well. But it's all about knowing him, and it's all about knowing us. Amen? I'm going to get into some more scriptures next week about knowing him. Knowing him. Why it's important to know him. What, did the, what does the word say about knowing him? And I'm not talking about knowing the scriptures. I'm talking about knowing him. It's a big difference between knowing the scriptures and knowing him. I can read a book about Donald J. Trump, our current president, but that don't mean I know him. I know some things about him because I read a book. See, I know some things about God because I've read a book and I continue to read a book. But then when I go spend time with him, I see that the things that I read, that's really who it is because I begin to experience those things for myself. We're going to talk about that next week. What you got?